Let's give a round of applause for Marina. Thank you so much for all of you for coming. We're actually very, very fortunate this evening we have with us a very special guest speaker, uh, His Holiness Devamrita Swami. A little uh, bio about Devamrita Swami so you know who is speaking. So Devamrita Swami is a monk in the renounced order of life with profound spiritual practices reaching back several decades. A Yale graduate himself, he looks forward to sharing his wisdom and insight with students and anyone looking to learn and access higher knowledge. His cutting-edge presentations capture a variety of current pressing themes from student life, mental stress, ecological sustainability, yoga, meditation, karma, desire management, and spiritual economics with students and anyone. Devamrita Swami is also an advisor on spiritual economics to the Russian Chamber of Commerce and the author of several books. In the past few years, he has addressed thousands of people on diverse topics such as yoga, vegetarianism, spiritual economics, environmentalism, and more. He has presented at top universities like Yale, UCLA, New York University, and other around the globe. He has given talks at York University, University of Toronto, Ryerson University, George Brown, and numerous downtown yoga studios. Currently based in New Zealand, Devamrita Swami travels and writes, always meeting new people and sharing his spiritual wisdom. He has authored several books, among them, Searching for Vedic India, we have it here on display, the book Searching for Vedic India. Perfect Escape Beyond the Barriers of Limited Science and Spiritual Greed. His strategic guidance has provided, has proved invaluable to students and professionals seeking to balance their material and spiritual lives. The regular stops on his global circuit are Australia, Canada, USA, South Africa, Russia, India, Argentina, Chile, UK, and Central Europe. Yeah. So let's welcome His Holiness Deva Amrita Swami. So we will hear from him for the next hour or so, and then he will lead us into a few minutes of the mantra chanting, and then we have special uh, Indian dinner prepared for all of you. So please stay with us for the next hour. And we would request um, all of you kindly come forward so we create a nice energy, we create nice enthusiasm. So don't mind, please come forward. And at the end of the discussion, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask and they are this
of friends, you know. So, I know that in your own way, you want to be successful. And again, I wonder how much you're aware of all the costs for success. I see many shaking your head, but generally you don't think about that. Uh, you feel that as a young person, coming of age and ready for action in terms of making your mark in the world, advancing your career, exercising your options, you feel that that's, that mindset is the main thing. We like to feel that we have lots of choices. We've been trained, we've been conditioned to think that the more choices you have, the more freedom you have, the more autonomy you have, the more opportunity for individual expression. And then, of course we're thinking that it's money that creates all those options. Without money, your alternatives are very small. With money, the door opens wide. We're going to talk about whether material options actually give you what you want. In order to understand what you really want and really need, we have to talk about what is the real self. When we look at the yoga texts of ancient India, and I'm specifically speaking about the bhakti texts, which are considered the pinnacle of the yoga texts, we find that the real self is non-material. Therefore, to nourish that real self, we need non-material sustenance, we need non-material support. If our conception of success is simply how to provide different types of gratification for the body and mind. The yoga texts tell us we've missed the point completely. Before we strive so much for success, we should understand what is the real self. And here we find how the yoga texts excel in getting us on track. I'm going to tell you a story about two birds on a tree. But I'm going to tell it in two different ways. Here's the first version. The first version is these two birds on the tree. One bird is called more, and the other bird is called better. <laughs> it seems they always go together, right? More is always better. If, well, to use a popular college example, if two beers make you feel good, then 10 beers make you feel? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's a simple calculation. <laughs> If two parties make you feel good, ten parties make you feel better. So, so much of our quest for happiness and even success is based on the numbers. More, more, more. And implicitly, in Western society, this has been the assumption that the more you get, the more options you have, the more freedom you have, the more satisfaction you have. For so long, this has been accepted. Recently, however, 
even social scientists are starting to understand something went wrong here. Instead of the two birds, more and better, being on the same tree, it seems the bird known as better has flown off. <laughs> Meaning everyone is still focused on getting more, 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 but things aren't getting better, better, better. Both in terms of people's individual psychology, in terms of the environment, in terms of social well-being in general. More is no longer working out for bringing better. So as success-orientated persons, you need to take that into account because all the latest social research is pointing in that direction. Of course, no one really knows what will replace the more better track. No one knows. Uh, what can you really offer to people that is attractive enough and intense enough to replace their materialistic goals? Let's consider how you're programmed. What is the usual condition? There are two types of persons researchers have pointed out. One is called the maximizer. This research first came out 10 years ago, and now it's being republicized to see how people are reacting after 10 years of hearing about this. Generally, success means the maximizer. That means someone who at every moment is always analyzing how to get the best. Never be satisfied with second best. If you're listening to one radio station, what are you thinking while you're listening? What's on the other one? What's on the other one? <laughs> <laughs> I've got to be sure that nothing better is playing on the other station. If you're watching television, you're channel surfing because you you can't be the one to miss out on something better on another channel. You can't rest in peace. You have to always get the best at every moment. You're always checking the reviews. When you shop on Amazon, you study every single of 500 reviews. <laughs> it's so agonizing to make a decision because you have to be fully prepared, and you have to do a total analysis to find out and be sure this is the best thing. That's called the maximizer. And success generally means that. Success means how to shape you as a maximizer, because supposedly that's the way you're going to be happy. This maximizing syndrome affects every aspect of your life, from your choice of girlfriends and you know, choice of boyfriends, from your choice of jobs, from your choice of everything you do, your purchasing especially. It has to be the best. You can't be known for anything but the best. And then you are successful. An example, research was done at Columbia University about graduates there. Those who fit into the maximizer category, exhaustively sifting through all job offers, analyzing every job situation, pouring over countless details to make the best decision. Generally, these maximizers who graduated from Columbia University earn 20% more than the other type. And what's the other type called? A term has been coined for them, satisficers. They're like, yeah, this is good enough, this'll do. <laughs> It may not be the best, but it's all right with me. It's good enough. 
those words to a maximizer, of course, are, are poison. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. <laughs> so, in this study of students at Columbia University, the maximizers indeed got jobs with 20% more income. But, guess what? They were totally miserable. <laughs> Whereas the other guys, the satisficers, you know, good enough, yeah, that's all right, John. <laughs> they were much happier. So, what does that tell you about what you want to be? <laughs> You're trained to be a maximizer. But social researchers have found that the maximizers are so much into it, into their trip, that they're bordering on clinical depression. I don't know if you've heard, in a survey done by the US government, federal government, it was found that 45% of college students have at least one psychological problem that requires professional attention. Not that it doesn't mean here. <laughs> the other schools. Forty-five <laughs> percent have at least one. Something is not working out in terms of our quest for success. The maximizers held to be the pinnacle of success, but actually. They're miserable. Let's talk now about stress and anxiety. There are different types of anxiety. There can be bodily and mental anxiety. You've got bodily pains, and that affects you. It, it stresses you. You've got mental stress and anxiety. Maybe you can think of circumstances in which you were totally physically comfortable. You know, life's a beach, and you had no complaints whatsoever in terms of your body, yet your mind was filled with stress, your mind was on edge. Can you remember situations like that? So mental anxiety can be so overpowering that even when your body is comfortable, nicely gratified, still, everything is ruined when your mind is stressed out. So everyone can understand mental stress and anxiety, physical stress. Then there's social stress, social anxiety. What are others thinking about me? Am I fitting in? Am I being perceived as a good person or a smart person or a savvy person? Am I the kind of person that everyone's going to invite to their party? Or am I the type where everyone just forgets about me? This is social anxiety. Beyond that, though, there's still something beyond that is what's called existential anxiety. What's the purpose of life? What's this all about? Why am I struggling so much? Who am I anyway? Existential anxiety is unique to human beings. You don't see any chicken scratching the ground wondering, why am I a chicken? <laughs> but human beings, when they face maximum stress and anxiety in terms of their body, their mind, in terms of their social dealings, then they start wondering, what's the point of all this? What is the meaning of existence? What the yoga text will tell you is existential anxiety can actually be good for you. Because the purpose of this human form of life is to understand what is the real self? And what is the ultimate self? And the relationship between the two. The relationship between the tiny, non-material particle of consciousness and the supreme consciousness. When we look at bhakti texts, such as Bhagavad Gita 
and its graduate study, Srimad Bhagavatam. There we find a completely different standard of success. Yes, take care of your body, take care of your mind. But unless you know the process, unless you have the knowledge for unlocking the spiritual dynamics within, the non-material dynamics, actually your human form of life is a failure. What are normal ways that people try to relieve themselves of stress? When I say normal, I don't mean these are the best ways, but I mean this, these are the ways that people usually adopt. Okay, when you're stressed out, when you're overloaded with anxiety, what do you do? Huh? Smoke a cigarette. Smoke a cigarette. It really helps every time, right? Anyone else? Music. You put on some music. Work out. You work out in the gym or whatever. Sleep. Sleep. Okay. Eat a lot. Eat a lot. Watch movies. Watch movies. Meditate on what? Everyone's meditating on something. Don't tell me. We won't speak about the hormone meditations. <laughs> hey, uh, what do you do when you get stressed out? Throw a water bottle as hard as I can. Uh, okay. So, there are kind of low material methods of stress relief, and there are higher material methods of stress relief. Let's talk about the higher material methods, but bear in mind they're still material. You can go for a walk in nature. When I asked, let me tell you, when I asked this question just two weeks ago in Melbourne, Australia, I had different answers. Most of the persons said when they were, when they're stressed out, they go for a walk in nature. A few of them said they go bicycling. And fewer still said they jump in a car and drive. And when they're driving, they feel at one with the car, they feel in control, and, and they're out on the open road somewhere in that way. They try to dissipate their stress. <clears throat> fewer still said reading. They just start reading and lose themselves in the book. One guy, and everyone really looked at him when he said this, one guy said he relieves stress by studying. <laughs> everyone looked at him like he was some kind of nerd, you know? Because <laughs> they're thinking studying brain stress doesn't relieve stress. So anyway, the remedies that you seek for relieving stress may vary from continent to continent, but what I'd like to point out to you tonight is these various methods are all on the material platform. When seen from the Bhakti Yoga text, the Krishna Conscious text, these uh, remedies actually don't get the job done. And you can even become more sophisticated in your material attempts to cure stress. You can do physical yoga, you can do yogic breathing exercises, and indeed those things are the best for the material body and material mind. But have you really gotten to the core of the stress problem? Basically all that society can recommend to you after putting you on this high stress maximization success program all the society can really recommend is start breathing deeply, do some stretching, go for a walk. These remedies will not get the job done. I'd like to tell you a story about an extraordinary five-year-old you. You'll find this history in the graduate study to Bhagavad Gita. This five-year-old boy was named Prahlad. Those of you from India, 
they recognize the name. Uh, somehow or other, although only five years old, he had so much knowledge. He was fixed on enlightenment and self-realization. He was fixed on acting to achieve the ultimate goal of life. He had knowledge of his non-material self. He had knowledge of the Supreme Self. He had an immersion in the most essential Krishna conscious knowledge. His father, however, was a completely different character. His father was extraordinarily powerful. A dictator beyond the scope of what we can think of today. His father not only was a dictator, he was tyrannical. He was practically a terrorist. Yet he had such a lotus-like son, such a swan-like son, such an advanced yogi as a son. These things happen. So the father sent his son to school for learning material arts and sciences, like how to manipulate people, how to exploit people, how to uh, silence them, how to placate them, and in this way, how to rule effectively as a materialist. So one day, his five-year-old son comes home from school, and the father lovingly, you know he's very tyrannical and terroristic, Still, it's his son. He has affection for his son. He picks the little boy up, puts him on his lap, embraces him, and says, My dear boy, can you tell me, what is the best thing you learned in school today? Now, how would you expect a five-year-old boy to answer that normally? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, 1 plus 1 equals 2. What was the five-year-old boy Pilar's response? My dear father, oh, best of the materialists. He wasn't saying that as a compliment. But his father liked it, though. Yeah, best of the materialists. <laughs> My dear father, best of the materialists. Please hear this one thing. The best thing I've learned in school today is that anyone who has a material body and mind and thinks that is the self, they must be in anxiety. The father was shocked. Where does this stuff come from? What kind of school am I sending my boy to? I'm sending him to learn that everything is matter and that he should exploit, control, and enjoy matter to the utmost. And now he's coming back and telling me these things. That anyone who identifies the body of mind as a self must be in anxiety. Think about that. The father was shocked. How has my son been contaminated? Of course, the yogis know that the boy was giving the most, was giving a perfect answer. Think about that in terms of how it applies to you. How can we be peaceful if we are identifying with what we are not? How can we ever be successful? Some of you are aware of Bhagavad Gita, the prime bhakti yoga text. There Krishna explains in his first lesson in chapter two, Right at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita means the song of the supreme opulent one. Krishna explains that just as you change clothes, similarly you change bodies. But the body is not the real self. The mind is not the real self. You see in Bhagavad Gita, there's no meaning to the statement mind over matter. Because mind, the yogis know, is matter. It's just a subtle form of matter. So whether we identify with the physiology or we identify with the psychology, 
We've missed the point in terms of success. And the five-year-old Bhakti Yogi Pallad very eloquently pointed that out. You'll never get to peace as long as you think you are matter and that to satisfy yourself you need to manipulate and exploit matter. Whether that matter is in the form of silicon chips or plastic or steel or flesh, as long as you're trying to derive satisfaction from matter, you'll always be in anxiety. That's the real, that's the first step in genuine knowledge. Naturally, you want to be happy. I don't think anyone here goes out of their way to be distressful, to be absorbed in distress. You want happiness for yourself. But let's look at our conceptions of happiness, whether they are, whether they are grossly materialistic or even green materialistic, environmentally materialistic, if our conceptions of happiness are based on thinking we are matter, naturally we're going to pursue material acquisitions and material experiences as a way to satisfy ourselves. So the first step that Krishna advocates in Bhagavad Gita is confront this issue. <clears throat> what is the real self, material or non-material? Krishna doesn't ask you to take that on belief that you are non-material. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna presents the laboratory process for you to verify your non-material identity. And then, naturally, you'll be motivated to achieve non-material happiness once you understand what you actually are. In our title for this discussion tonight, we said, Beyond the Flow. Now, the flow is very glorified today. And some happiness researchers consider, in fact, many of them consider that the flow is actually what you want in terms of success. It is actually the essence of happiness. What do we mean by the flow? It means when you lose yourself in some activity, so much so that you lose track of time, you sort of feel like one with the music, you know, and you're just uh, totally absorbed. Uh, and that activity has meaning for you because you're lost in it. That is happiness. I don't know what you've done that you would, what you do that you would get that flow feeling, or sometimes people call it in the zone. What do you do when that happens? Yes? Sculpture. Sculpture. You just get lost and just, huh? Anyone else? Running. Running? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yes, that's a popular one. Chanting a Hare Krishna mantra. Chanting a Hare Krishna mantra. I never thought of that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Golfing. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Speaking you just words. get so absorbed in it, right? You just lose track of even playing poker. Playing poker. <laughs> okay. How about video games? No video gamers here. <laughs> so, are human beings the best at the flow? Are they really the best at being in the zone? Think about it. Animals are actually the best at being in the flow. They are totally locked in. Whereas human beings, they may lock in for a while, but then the existential anxiety start to take over. How long is this going to last? And what am I going to do when this ends? <laughs> Animals don't worry about that. Therefore, if we want to see the best creatures 
for being in the flow, we have to look at animals. But do we want to be animals? We are animals. Human beings have the advanced consciousness for understanding what is the self, what is the supreme source, and what is the relationship between the two. This is the kind of knowledge that Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita. Why should we strive for what the animals can do so naturally? Now this five-year-old boy, Pallad, points out something very interesting. He says that generally in the animal species, only one sense is predominant. You know classic examples of how different animals are manipulated according to one particular sense. Deer, supposedly are captured by sound. Uh, moths, by sight, they fly into the fire. Uh, fish, by their tongue, they swallow the bait every time. Uh, so many animals, by smell. But what does this five-year-old yogi say about human beings? All five senses are pulling at them at once. He describes it to be like a guy who has five girlfriends. You think, well, that's really great, huh? <laughs> and they're all pulling on him at the same time. Come with me, come with me, come with me. Or we can make the example unisex and say, a girl with five boyfriends. Okay. So, how do you get any peace? They're pulling at you all at once. So similarly, this five-year-old yogi says, the human form of life gives you five senses. And Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita that actually the mind is the sixth sense because with your mind you feel things. These senses are pulling at you all, all at once. How are you going to be in such a flow that all the senses are locked in for a significant amount of time? The animals can do it. They're totally fixed on bodily affairs. They're totally surrendered to the one dominant sense they have. But human beings, they can't do it. <laughs> They're always worried, unless they're intoxicated 24-7. I'm sure none of you can do it as your students. <laughs> unless human beings are totally dulled by intoxication, they sooner or later start thinking, what's it all about? Why am I doing this? So why then should we present to human beings that the flow is where it's at? So therefore, tonight's theme, beyond the flow. Let's go back to stress and success. We should be striving for a different type of success. Yes, one has to maintain the body. You have a body of matter. You have a mind of matter. You have to look to the health of those acquisitions. But is that the most important thing in life? The greatest treasure that the knowledge of ancient India can offer the world begins with understanding the non-materiality of the self and the relationship between your non-material self and the supreme self. So in the beginning, I talked to you about two birds on a tree. And I mentioned to you that there's another version. Remember the first version? Two birds on the tree. One is more, and the other bird's better. For so long, everyone thought, these two birds always stay on the same tree. Uh, they, they work together. They go together. They love each other. <laughs> In other words, the more you have, the better your life is. Now, there is so much doubt about that. But what do you do next? If you can't be grossly materials, materially successful, what are you going to do? I always bring up an example. 
happened to me when I was speaking at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. The University of Cape Town is the premier institution on the African continent. And so in the audience, there was much, much more students than here now. There are about 200 students and professors. So I was speaking about sustainable happiness. And I mentioned to the audience, I'm sure that so many of you have heard of the latest research pointing out that beyond a basic middle class standard of living, any further increase in income or luxury does not lead to an increase in happiness as objectively measured. So I said, well, how many of you have heard of that? Maybe I should ask you, how many of you have heard of that? Okay. At University of Cape Town. Out of 200, I would say 190. So, then I asked another question. I said, since most of you, in fact, almost all of you, students and professors, have heard of this, if you go from poverty to middle class living, then there is a market increase in your happiness as measured material. But if you go from the middle class standard of living to any higher standard of wealth and luxury, happiness doesn't climb up with you. So I said, you all, almost all, you know about this. All right, let me ask you another question. How many of you are prepared to live life on a basic middle class standard of living? No one raised their hand. So what does that tell you? There's a huge disconnect between what we know and what we will do with our life. In other words, we're very conditioned. How are we conditioned? We've been implanted with feelings of inadequacy. I feel bad because I don't have such and such. I'm incomplete because I'm missing such and such. In a consumer society, you're always being set up in this way to feel inadequate and therefore you need to make an acquisition in order to fill that inadequacy. Maybe you can look at your life and start to see how those manipulative strings have pulled you. You need this, you need that. That inadequacy and manipulation combines with something else called social comparison. You're looking around and what do you see? Others have what I don't have. Others must be happy and I'm not happy. I'm the only one who's missing something. You get manipulated by these syndromes. What's the latest one? That's so prevalent because everyone has a smartphone. It's called FOMO. Anyone know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. You think that simply by the proliferation of smartphones and tablets that people are more connected and therefore they're more happy. No. Social psychologists have pointed out that this is what happens. You have to stay in your room on a Friday night and study for an exam. Meanwhile, all your friends are out at a club. <laughs> and what do they do? They send pictures, even video clips, live, you know, live video, you know. <laughs> and how do you feel? They're miserable. Yeah, you feel miserable. <laughs> You're missing out. So instead of the technology bringing people together, it's actually increasing their depression. Because <laughs> you can see it live. Yeah. They're at a club, they're at a cafe, at a concert. And what are you doing? You're not there. So this fear of missing out is based on the false assuredness 
that other people are happy. How can you protect yourself against all these illusions? In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna points out that this is the way the energy of illusion works. And Krishna claims that this energy of illusion belongs to him. But he's also presenting to the fortunate listener. He's presenting that he has another energy, which is superior. That energy, non-material, purely spiritual, that is where we should find our real environment. Real yoga means to recognize that there is an energy of illusion and that there is an energy of spiritual sustenance. And more than that, the real yogi understands the source of all the energies. So when we talk about Krishna, you know literally what Krishna means? It is the most precise and profound understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth. Krishna means the all-attractive, unlimited source of pleasure. Now who could object to that? <laughs> Yoga means to connect. To connect with what? Everyone's trying to connect with something. Just like in your material pursuits, you're trying to connect with success, money, bodily and mental gratification, prestige, fame, appreciation. The yogi understands you should strive for the ultimate connection. Connect to the ultimate source of knowledge and pleasure. That's how Krishna presents himself in Bhagavad Gita. Should we accept it just on belief? Does Krishna in Bhagavad Gita ask you to believe? No. Everywhere in Bhagavad Gita, you'll find Krishna presenting here is the laboratory technique. Apply it. Enter into the bhakti laboratory. Apply the technique. You'll get the results. Isn't that fair enough? <laughs> Often we're afraid of being true believers because so many people are going around saying, believe this, believe that. But in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna simply presents the process for verifying what he's saying. He explains, there's an energy of illusion and there's an energy of spiritual nourishment and sustenance. Take your pick which one you want to hang out with. <laughs> the successful yogi, no matter what sphere of life he or she is in, to be a successful yogi doesn't mean you have to give up your studies, give up your working, give up your family. No, it means how to do those things with the right motivation and the right goal. Those of you who know anything about Bhagavad Gita, you know that Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita not to some kind of sadhu or yogi in the Himalayas. He spoke to a family man. In fact, he spoke to an administrative military type man. He spoke the topmost yoga instructions to that kind of person. Because sometimes we feel unnecessarily inadequate. Yes, what you're saying sounds good, Swami. But you know, I gotta study, you know, I gotta get a job, you know. I don't have a family. <laughs> Therefore, I just can't really think about who I am. <laughs> Even though I get existential anxieties, I can't really go that route. In terms of self-realization, enlightenment, journey of self-discovery, I can't Sounds good, but what can I do? I'm trapped. No, you're not trapped. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna teaches you how to be in this world and function at a maximal level of spiritual attainment. That is the wonder of Bhagavad Gita. So what I'd like to do tonight is reshape if you don't mind, reshape your conceptions of success. 
something is missing. We'll never solve the stress and anxiety problem on the material level. Who was it, Albert Einstein, who said, a problem is never solved on the level that it originated. You have to go to a higher level. So I agree with that 100%. On the physiological, on the psychological level, you can't make a real solution to the problems of stress. If you want real success, you have to go to a higher level. And that requires knowledge. That requires experience. So I'm advocating that along with your education, along with your material affairs, add the real core, and then you'll be successful, genuinely. Simply being in the flow, calling that happiness, it's not going to work. As I said, the animals are much better at that than human beings. The material flow, no matter what it is, will never satisfy you because the real you is non-material. So finally, the other version of the two birds on the tree. This is an example given in the yoga texts, particularly the Upanishads. Many of you are familiar with that. The two birds are both conscious entities. One is a tiny particle of spiritual consciousness, the living entity. The other is the supreme consciousness. The bird that represents the tiny particle of consciousness, the living entity, in illusion is trying to enjoy the fruits of the tree the fruits of the tree of material nature. The other bird, representing the supreme consciousness, is watching, waiting for when the bird, that's the little consciousness, the little part of the consciousness, when that bird gets tired of the material fruits. Once you start to tire of trying to enjoy the material fruits, the supreme consciousness, then can reveal to you a better way of life. But as long as you're feeling so enthusiastic, material success, material gratification, where is it? I can't get enough of it. You can never take notice of the supreme consciousness that's trying to tap you on the shoulder, so to speak, so you go into another direction. So we need to get beyond the stage of thinking that more and better are birds on the same tree, especially when even academic researchers are telling you the bird known as better has flown away. You're just grasping for more and more and more, but the, the bird of better is gone, flown the coop. Maybe it's time that the enjoying bird, the little bird that's trying to enjoy the material fruits, starts to listen to the supreme bird, the supreme consciousness. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is directing your attention to different goals, different fruits. That is real success. And you can have that in all your different walks of life. So these are just a few points. I wanted to present to you tonight. I thank you for your kind attention. Are there any questions? Yes. I have a question. Um, Good. You were talking about living beyond the flow. Yes. And the best thing is to get away from being very materialistic. And that's the beginning of the emergence of being in your supreme self. How do you know instinctively when that happens is when you just let go, kind of like let go and let God, you just decide to stop trying to make things happen and just be? That's a very good question. You know, 
you remind me of your question that is reminds me of something I saw my youngest brother do uh, when he was newly married. He and his wife had just graduated from Harvard Law and they had taken high pressure corporate jobs in Manhattan and New York. Success. Just give me a bit of that <laughs> from the material point of view. Uh, I told them early today I was going to use them as an example in my presentation. <laughs> Didn't say anything. <laughs> he was, last week he was general counsel for Toyota in North America. He's the chief compliance officer for Toyota in North America. Now he's general counsel for Toyota worldwide and chief compliance officer for Toyota worldwide. So he's successful. But what about the anxiety? What about the inner development? Anyway, when he had just graduated from law school and he was, and his wife also, uh, they're working high pressure corporate jobs in New York City. And so they would get home around 8.30 at night and she would be more obvious about her stress. You know, ladies can, you know, men will lock it up inside until they start drinking, but ladies, you know, they just, they just download on you. <laughs> of course, each gender thinks that their method is better, right? <laughs> so, she would be stressed out and downloading on him, and he would just look at her and say, Arlene, let go. Let go. And she would just look at him like totally baffled. Like, <laughs> early stages of marriage, you know, before he got trained up. So, <laughs> it will not suffice simply to say, let go, and then all that we need will come to us. What we require is knowledge. And what I've been talking about tonight is based on the most profound spiritual wisdom and comprehensive spiritual knowledge. That is what we require. We need to make a wisdom culture which gives people the knowledge they need to apply the spiritual technology and get the results. So I'm talking about far more than just let go. Temporarily, it helps to let go. But how long can you sustain that? It's like if a child is mischievous and naughty, and you tell the child, just sit in the corner. How, how long can that last? So sometimes people talk about stopping all desire, letting go of everything, just be. You ever tried it? <laughs> no, you want things to do. You're an active person. So we have to find the best way to be active. So that's what Bhagavad Gita offers, an action program for attaining the highest consciousness. Attaining the love supreme. That is what Krishna is offering in Bhagavad Gita. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Yes. Um, so, I'll, I'll give the mic up for us. Sure. Turn it on. So recently I kind of found out about myself, about, um, I actually worked about 40 hours a week and went to school full time. So um, I, I didn't know I was so stressed out until recently I kind of had like this freeze where like this one day, like, a couple days ago, I just froze and I just like couldn't do anything. And ever since then I kind of like started questioning like, like the whole materialistic world, you know, um, I, you know I, I'm going to be working for corporate finance so it's it's, you know, that's what I pursued my whole life, but I'm kind of realizing that that's not what I really wanted in a way, but it was just like kind of a side that I wanted. It wasn't like the main thing that I wanted. So my question for you is, how and when did you find peace with yourself? Because I'm, I'm starting to find just that, you know, the flow, just that like moment of truth where I can just really be honest with myself, and it's just like, it's, it makes me feel uncomfortable, but um, how and when um, did you start feeling that? Just having 
complete peace and so on. You're asking me? Yeah. Or me personally? Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something that's true. It might be a little embarrassing for me, but true stories are appreciated. <laughs> This was May of 1972. I was in my last month at Yale University. And I was preparing for my final exams. I, I wanted some relief from the stress of the last month. So my roommate and I turned on the TV to get some relief. But you see, because we were Yale students, we wouldn't watch the television in the way that normal students would. We would watch television with the volume turned down all the way, and then we would speculate what was happening. And that way we distinguished ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> As the, the elite. So, <laughs> so, we saw these strange persons, that, you know, just like me and dressed like him. I said, who are these aliens? <laughs> turn, up, turn up the volume. I cannot figure out what in the world they're talking about. So we heard them explain some of the things I was explaining tonight. And they would talk about their lifestyle and purifying the consciousness to go to a higher level, reconnecting with Krishna, the Supreme Consciousness. They kept using the word over and over again, Ananda, the Sanskrit word referring to. It's hard to define because it's not material happiness. It's nothing composed of material energy. So they were talking on and on like that. And you know what I said? It's a true story. I turned to my roommate and said, these people are fools. <laughs> <laughs> I said, they've missed the goal of life. They talk about Ananda, we'll invite them to one of our parties, we'll show them what Ananda is. <laughs> <laughs> Two months later, after I graduated, I started reading Bhagavad Gita. I got a genuine, authentic version of Bhagavad Gita. And before I would go to any gathering like this, you know, I was a New Yorker, cynical, you know. <laughs> California is laid back and open. New Yorkers think they know everything. <laughs> so, before I would go to a gathering like this, I read Bhagavad Gita and its graduate studies four hours a day for six months straight. Then I finally came to a gathering like this after six months of it. So, you know, I wasn't a, I wasn't a soft sell, you know. <laughs> I was hardcore. So I'm telling you this to show that if there's hope for me, <laughs> certainly there's much more for you. What did I do that made the difference? In spite of my jaded, cynical New Yorker mentality, I actually took the trouble to dive into that spiritual knowledge see for myself what was going on. I wanted to make a complete solution to the existential anxiety. So I'm telling you that story so that perhaps you can see a way forward for yourself. Now, you don't have to become a specialist like me. Every field has its specialist. Just like everyone who goes to university doesn't wind up as a professor, right? Uh -huh. But you do need some people as professors. <laughs> so I recommend that if you investigate this bhakti process, which is all based on knowledge, not vague beliefs, and apply it in your lifestyle, you'll see the results. That's what I recommend. All right. Thank you for your honest self-appraisal, and thank you for lucidly seeking a solution. 
Amen. Yeah. Um, maybe a year ago, I was uh, in quest of truth, understanding. And uh, I came across the tangent uh, text, particularly the tantra of the left hand. And the primary uh, goal there is the abatement of the ego. Now, you're concentrating on the self and happiness. And the Tantra text had told me that this in itself was an egocentric uh, 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 goal and that it should be avoided. And I was just wondering, is there uh, you know, some differentiation between the self seeking happiness and the ego, which should be denied its gratification. Very good question. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that there are two things. You see, Sanskrit is a very precise language for issues of enlightenment. Just like English is known as the business language, they say French is the language of romance. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> German used to be known as the engineering and scientific language. So Sanskrit has terms for things that are not clearly delineated in the English language. So in Bhagavad Gita, you'll find these two Sanskrit words, ahamkar and hankar. Ahamkar means false ego. Hankar means the real thing. The goal of yoga is to purify the false self and bring out the real self. So. In miscellaneous other texts, they focus on do away with your false ego, but they don't present what is the real ego. Often people aren't ready to hear that. But in Bhagavad Gita, you'll find both the positive and the negative together. You cannot kill desire, but you should get rid of false desire so that the desires of the pure spiritual self in relation to the supreme self express themselves again. That's actually the perfection of yoga. This is what is this is what is known as Krishna consciousness. How your pure self acts in a pure loving relationship with the supreme self, the love supreme. But as long as the false ego is in the way and the main manifestation of false ego is thinking, I'm the body and I'm the mind. And I'm going to get material happiness from my body and mind. That's the false ego. So we need to understand the positive and the negative side. Hunkar is the real self, the real ego. We're not trying to stamp out the real ego. You can't do that if you try. But the false ego, the counterfeit self, is what's causing all the problems. I hope that makes things a little clearer. Yes. I thank you. Thank you. Wonderful questions. Yes. So uh, you had mentioned that um, you had mentioned earlier how if we really strive for success, at least anxiety, and that those who settle for second best tend to be content. And you gave an example with statistics as well before. Um, so my question is, should we aim for second best, or should we just um, continue to strive for second best? The ideal lifestyle is one in which your main goal is your spiritual development. You never settle for second best when it comes to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, according to you, how do you make up for wrong when you know you've done it, and you feel that it's you feel you feel sorry for that. You know you've done something wrong. Yes. Well, who decides what is wrong? You go against what you were taught was right. Yeah, who's your teacher? <laughs> well, your parents, I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> do you remember the cigarette advertisements on television in the 50s? No, you wouldn't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a 
famous TV advertisement for Camel cigarettes. It began with, what cigarette do doctors mostly smoke? Camel. More doctors smoke Camel than any other brand. You should smoke a Camel too. I'm going to show a doctor and his nurse, and the nurse brings him a bag of Camels. <laughs> And of course, history is full of examples in which nations did things and then later they wonder why did they do that? Try to be a damn war. Everyone scratches their head, but the world. <laughs> so, who decides what is right and what is wrong? How Bhagavad Gita deals with that is if you want the most precise information about how to live, you take your information from the Supreme Source because you are an energy from that source. Therefore, Krishna, the ultimate source, is the actual decider of what is right and what is wrong. Generally speaking, what is right means that which furthers your spiritual development. What is wrong is that which interferes with your spiritual development. How's that sound? It sounds good. I'm just wondering what, what, what can I do if I have made a mistake? Is there anything you can do to uh, try to make up for doing something bad? Well, practically speaking from the wisdom of the yoga texts, I have to tell you that lifetime after lifetime you've been making mistakes and you won't get to the bottom of it by material methods. So therefore, the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita, since you asked, the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita tells you that you can make a one-stop solution to all the bad karma <laughs> by taking Krishna's methodology, following that, and then Krishna promises all your bad karma will be taken care of. Don't worry. That's the pinnacle of the yoga system. Otherwise, you've got so many karmic reactions chasing you from so many lifetimes. You can't handle it all individually. Where do you begin? Okay, there may be some things that stick out in your mind. You knew you were wrong. Uh, there are things that stick out in my mind that I know I was wrong. But there's so much you're not aware of. Just by your walking on the ground, you're stepping on so many living entities. What gives you the right to do that? Just by walking in the park on the grass, you're stepping on the heads of the grass. What gives you the right to do that? Unless you've been a vegetarian since birth, the general diet <coughs> brings you lots of bad karma because it's the unnecessary slaughter of living entities. This information in the prime yoga text, Bhagavad Gita, is essential for a thinking person like you who's concerned. I've done so many things that I know are wrong, and I've done a lot that, I, that are wrong, and I can't, I'm not even aware of how to handle all that. You can't handle it all individually, trying to make up for this thing you did wrong and that thing you did wrong. Best to adopt the one-stop solution. So Krishna says, you approach him, take the methodology he gives at the pinnacle of the yoga system as a supreme goal of the yoga system, and then all your lifetimes of bad karma is taken care of. Don't miss out on the offer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Another one, huh? Um, before I ask the question, I want to say thank you for coming. I really enjoyed uh, your sharing on tonight. But my question is, based on a Hare Krishna teaching, then is it a, an illusion to believe that the mind, body, and soul, and spirit can uh, become in harmony with itself? And the second part of my question is, what do you think about the laughing saint? I think she's from India. By laughing like that, can you get into that supreme part of yourself? 
Okay, first of all, you can harmonize the body, the mind, and the non-material self when you understand that they're all energies coming from the same source. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna points out, these are all energies that belong to him, and if you use all those energies for the purpose of your spiritual development, that's the harmony. Just like you're not your clothes, but your clothes are all, relatively speaking, functioning as part of your carrying on your life, right? But you know you're not your clothes. Similarly, your body and your mind, they're not you, but if you use them for what is the real purpose in life, then there's harmony. So you use even what is temporary and material for the overall purpose of spiritual development. That's harmony. The second part, uh, laughing your way to it. This is Saint. I think she's from India. And I saw it on the. You know, there's a lot going on in India. She <laughs> 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 has some Indians here. They, uh, you'll find everything there. You know? <laughs> and suppose that she goes around and she teaches people how to laugh to bring themselves in harmony with themselves. Well, certainly laughing reduces your stress temporarily, but nowhere in the Vedic texts, which are the manuals, the guidebooks for the pursuit of enlightenment, nowhere is the laughing technique mentioned. Now, in terms of material living, I can think of a lot worse things to do than laughing all the time. <laughs> but in terms of spiritual development, we need to understand genuine applied spiritual technology. Now, another thing, though, is that in bhakti yoga, a genuine practitioner is jolly, but that happiness is not contrived. Let's just sit down and laugh. <laughs> it's the natural outpouring of the reviving of your spiritual identity as part of Krishna. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. How are we doing for time? Okay. Very nice questions. I wasn't expecting such wonderful questions. So, um, like the yoga system, <coughs> uh, there are other um, systems or processes which also uh, talk about uh, getting to know yourself or enlightenment. So uh, does the process really matter? And also, um, while you are um, trying to search for yourself, uh, is it like the true self searching for itself? I mean... That sounds pretty good, huh? <laughs> true self searching for itself. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, I mean, if it's the true self, isn't it already the true self? It's what? Uh, I don't know what. Uh, what was the last thing you said? I mean, you said. What was the last thing you said just before? Did I hear you say, I don't know. Yes. Oh, okay. We need to get precise understanding of spiritual knowledge and spiritual technique. That's why we have the standard textbooks. By following the royal road, so to speak, you can safely achieve your objective. But in dealing with things that are beyond the range of your senses, how are you going to speculate your way to that? So an essential point in Bhagavad Gita is that the, uh, the spiritual knowledge and applied spiritual technology comes from the ultimate source. It can't come from you because you're too tiny, you're finite. How are you going to bust your way into the infinite? It can only be done with the help from the infinite. It can't come all from your side, you're too tiny. Because the infinite has infinite possibilities the infinite can make himself known even to the finite. But from the finite side, to try to grasp the infinite, categorically impossible. Think about that.
Are you thinking about that now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up question? Alright. Uh, isn't the finite already the finite? What's that? Isn't the finite or the, fi the person already the infinite or does it have to? Now does that make sense? I mean, yeah. because... The finite is already the infinite. Then why do you use the word finite? Because... Or look at it another way. If you're infinite, <laughs> then how come you're in ignorance? Think about it. There's nothing wrong with accepting your tiny, your tiny status as a finite particle of non-material consciousness. There's nothing wrong with that. Your glory is in connection with the Supreme Consciousness, in connection to Krishna. That is your glory. But you can never be the Supreme Consciousness. I think that's quite obvious, right? Oh, you have some hopes. <laughs> If you're really interested in these subject matters, we invite you, as well as we invite everyone, please, if you explore Bhagavad Gita, you'll find the most comprehensive spiritual knowledge. I highly recommend that. All right? Thank you. Okay. What is the title of your book over there? It's called Searching for Vedic India. It's meant for persons like you who have an inquisitive mind and an unbiased intellect and a good heart. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, so I want to go back to your analogy with the birds. Ah, I like that one. I also want to um, reference, I guess, another. Um, are you familiar with Plato's Cave? Plato's Cave. Plato's Cave. Are you familiar with the, the story? Allegory of the Cave. Yeah, allegory. Oh, Plato's Cave, of course. Um, so, the whole idea of birds, how we're kind of that bird that's kind of like eating all the material things, mm -hmm. but we're also kind of the bird that's watching it, um, the supreme consciousness. Um, kind of like, it kind of to me, it sounded kind of like a cave analogy where um, we're within the cave and we're used to seeing these shadows, these yes. plastic shadows, but yes. um, we can only attain a certain awareness of what's beyond the cave and light, but we're actually... Because especially because we won't turn around and look and see what's going on in the entrance yeah. of the cave. We're, we're so entertained and distracted and gratified and indulged, we're just staring at the flickering images on the back of the cave. So, um, so basically, in that situation, we can't turn our heads, and I guess we can't be observing ourselves. But so, to kind of achieve this um, existential consciousness, is it to be more so aware when we're going through daily life and our activities that there is something beyond ourselves and our section? Look, in using the example, the allegory of Plato's cave, in which persons are sitting just mesmerized by flickering shadows on the back of the cave and they don't know that those shadows are produced by a fire at the mouth of the cave and someone passing various articles uh, before that fire so that shadows are cast deep into the back of the cave. The solution is get these persons to turn around and look and see what's going on. But because they're so addicted to material gratification, they're lost in a consumer society. They're chasing the success of the flickering shadows on the wall. They won't turn around. So what spiritual knowledge does for you, genuine spiritual knowledge and genuine spiritual technique does for you, is actually to induce you to turn around and see what's really going on and make a change. It's not about belief, it's not about intuition, it's about proper knowledge, comprehensive knowledge, and genuine technique. So, sorry, I have a follow-up question. So, um, if we are to, I guess, turn around um, and kind of 
become aware of existential consciousness. Um, is there a way that we can express that with our material self? Yes, because both matter and the spiritual energy come from the same source. So there's a way to use your body and mind responsibly in harmony with the purposes of the Supreme. The Bhakti Yoga system will give you a complete understanding of that. How to use what is temporary to achieve what is eternal. That's the topmost mysticism. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks for your uh, commentary. I uh, read the Bhagavad Gita a couple of uh, years ago in two different translations, and I was looking for a book that would lead to not only uh, internal peace, but external peace. And I was disappointed that Arjuna went to war at the end of the, in my reading at the end of Bhagavad Gita. So I'd love to hear your interpretation of how Bhagavad Gita relates to war and peace in, in the external world. Thanks. Do you understand Arjuna's situation? What led to the battle? First of all, Arjuna is not a military conscript. He's not drafted. He is a professional administrator warrior. It, and it is his job to stand up and protect the innocent. So the other side had tried to burn down his house with his family inside. They tried to administer poison to his wife and children. They tried every way to slaughter him. Still, in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna being so soft-hearted and is wondering, even though they're wrong, I know them. Some of them are my distant relatives. Some of them are my friends, former teachers. That's how soft-hearted he was. So Krishna reminded him that as a Vedic warrior, you're meant to stand up and protect the innocent. You're meant to stop injustice. So it's not like Arjuna was an ordinary civilian. He was duty-bound to stand up for righteousness. This was no oil war. <laughs> this is no war over resources. The other side was clearly uh, far in the wrong from any point of view. I mean, to try to kill some, someone's wife and children. They even tried to take his wife in public, in a public arena, and strip her. From the Vedic point of view, this was totally wrong. Yet, because Arjuna was so soft-hearted, he was saying, that's just the way they are. Maybe we should just leave it at that. Another point, this battle of Bhagavad Gita involved no civilians. This is the Vedic style of, bat of battling. The professional warrior class would go off to some remote place and have it out. And whoever emerged victorious, the citizens would recognize as the government and pay their taxes. And so that's the way it was. So it's far different from the way war is waged now. In which, what's the first thing that happens in a war today? The women and children are affected. So we have to understand the whole situation of Arjuna, and then we can see that this was no foolish war. This was, this was not a uh, this random act of violence, insensitive, cruel. From any point of view, even just self-defense, he had to do what he did. So that's why Krishna was chastising him. How can you not do your duty? You have to protect the innocent. It's your own family. <laughs> Let's speak of so many others. The other side was completely corrupt. Obviously, they were going to do such things. But 
Besides Arjuna's duty to act as a Vedic warrior with integrity and honor, there was something higher at stake. Krishna used the whole crisis to impart lessons of how we are not the body, we are the non-material self. The body must be finished, but the real self, known in Sanskrit as the Atma, continues even though the body takes birth and dies. So Bhagavad Gita is going on on two levels at the same time. And both levels are correct, but the spiritual level is much more important. So I hope that kind of... Well, it, it's uh, in conflict, sorry, uh, it's in conflict with Gandhi's saying that uh, an eye for an eye makes us both blind. That's right. So one has to decide whether Gandhi had his own idea of Bhagavad Gita and should call it that. And leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm so much impressed by your questions. I was, Thursday I was speaking at UNLV in Las Vegas, and I thought they were a pretty good audience, but now your questions here definitely <clears throat> have made the day. What is it all about marriage, sex, and kids, right? Meaning, in your story, uh, with respect to the, uh, the tree and the birds, right? Uh, is it marriage is another fruit of the tree or the materialistic world? Second part of it. One at a time. <laughs> you asked about marriage and children and what else? Sex. Is it just the material fruit on the tree? Yeah. It depends on what the purpose of all that is. Mm -hmm. If the purpose of the marriage and having children is as partners in the quest for enlightenment, then that is not a material fruit. Just like my dear associate here, Sovastas, he's the president of Krishna community in Los Angeles. He's a married man. He has a wife. He has a son. He's got a grandson. <laughs> but he is the purpose of his family is a hundred percent spiritual development. Now, you ask about those things, uh, marriage, family, procreation. I mean I'm not exactly sure how his son came into being, but <laughs> I don't think the sun dropped from the sky. <laughs> but Krishna says a very interesting thing in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says he is that procreation when the consciousness is focused on bringing into the world an advanced child that can benefit the world. Krishna says that act, I am. That is also the pinnacle of 